Hello and welcome to this tutorial on psychological assessment. So this tutorial is adapted from the first part of chapter 4 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. You can find other resources on the clinical applications of RFT at languageasintervention.com. In this tutorial, you will learn about creating an experiential context for assessment and how to assess context sensitivity. So let's first remember the general principles guiding our use of RFT in clinical work. We have a general framework which includes two overarching goals, shaping flexible context sensitivity and functional coherence. These goals can be achieved through one overarching strategy, transforming symbolic functions by altering the context. In order to alter the context, we can use language, which can be broken down into types of relational framings. Each type of framing has its own way of altering the context and transforming functions. So what is the goal of doing a psychological assessment from an RFT perspective, and how can we do that? Well, given that the goals of therapy are to improve flexible context sensitivity and functional coherence, it makes sense to assess the client's competency in these domains. Broadly speaking, we want to evaluate if the client is aware of the sources of influence impacting his behavior, and if he conceptualizes his experiences in a useful way. So said another way, we want to know if the client is able to notice a variety of elements of the context and to respond to what is relevant, and if he's able to make sense of his experience in a way that helps him reach his goals and build a meaningful life. We can then choose and tailor our interventions based on the strengths and weaknesses of the client in these areas. Before we get into the details of assessing context sensitivity and coherence, we need to consider a few elements that set the context for doing assessment in line with CBS and RFT. The first element is to focus on the client's experience. As we saw before, using an experiential approach helps identify interventions that will be adapted to the client's specific needs. Except when the client's judgment is severely impaired, as it might be the case in uh, acute episodes of psychosis, for example, it is generally a good idea to trust the client's observations. Remember that we are not aiming for objective truth here, but for awareness of one's own experience. What matters is that the client is able to notice relevant elements of his experience. If we think that some important elements might be missed, it is always possible to encourage the client to explore these elements. But, as, but that is generally done through an invitation to observe, rather than through descriptions formulated by the therapist, except when the therapist's observations can enhance the client's awareness in a useful way, of course. We could summarize this experiential approach by saying that assessment is not done to the client, but with the client. Of course, the therapist has her expertise, and the client counts on this expertise, but the therapist's expertise is more in helping her, her client observe his own experience than in the client's experience per se. In other words, the therapist knows what useful questions should be asked, but it's the client who knows the answers. Another thing that characterizes the context of assessment is the connection between the therapeutic process and the client's life. There are two places where the client's clinically relevant behaviors, or CRBs, can occur. In the client's life outside the therapy session, and in the therapy session. When they happen outside the session, they can be included in the therapeutic process through the client's reports. For example, a client tells a therapist about relapsing into drinking alcohol, or about her cancelling an important meeting out of anxiety. She can also report progress, like when she was able to do something meaningful even if it triggered painful emotions. Thanks to the derived nature of language, what happens outside the session can be brought to the here and now of the session. In order to make the report more vivid and more present in session, the therapist can ask questions helping the client to report the out-of-session behavior as experientially as possible. For example, by asking questions about feelings, thoughts, sensations, and inquiring about the details of the context, like the time of the day, who was there, 
the atmosphere of the situation. The therapists can even use perspective taking and metaphors to increase contact with what is happening in the life outside the session, as if a kind of virtual reality device was activated, allowing both the client and the therapist to relive the event as if it was happening here and now. For example, the therapist might say, Could you tell me what happens in that situation, as if we were watching a video recording together? Take me through each step in slow motion, if you can. Okay, so I said that there are two places where the client's clinically relevant behaviors can occur, and the first is outside the session. The second place is inside the session, not through a report from the client, but as an actual instance, here and now. Sometimes, the exact same behavior happening in the client's life also happens in session. This is particularly true of behaviors involved in social interactions. For example, a client might show the same difficulties talking about his emotional life to the therapist as he does with his wife. Sometimes the form, or what we call the topography of the behavior, is quite different from what the client does outside the session, but functionally, it is still an instance of the clinically relevant behaviors occurring in the client's life outside the session. For example, a client who deals with anxiety by using substance like alcohol or medication will probably not use substances in session, but he might change topics of conversation or not look in the therapist's eyes or pretend he's sick and has to leave the session. The topography of these behaviors is different from using alcohol or medication but the function is still to decrease anxiety, and thus it is an instance of the clinically relevant behaviors we can assess in session. So these kinds of uh, in-session CRBs can occur spontaneously, but they can also be evoked by the therapist. The point is not to encourage the client to do something that is not effective or healthy, of course. The point is to assess what the client does in a given context. For example, Asking a client what he's feeling right now can be a way of assessing whether the client is comfortable and skilled at communicating his feelings to others. To summarize, in order to connect the therapeutic process to the client's life, we can use client's reports about their experiences and clinically relevant behaviors happening outside the session and encourage the client to report her observations as experientially as possible we can also notice and evoke in session clinically relevant behaviors that are functionally similar to what happens outside the session. Okay, so let's now explore how we can assess context sensitivity. The purpose of this process is to assess how the client is responding to the different sources of influence present in the context of his behaviors. Basically, we want to know how he is responding to antecedents and how he is responding to consequences. And the thing is, for one behavior, there are generally many antecedents and consequences involved at each moment and over time. So it means that the client might be more sensitive to some antecedents and consequences than to others. Ideally, the client is able to notice a variety of these antecedents and consequences and to respond to what is most relevant, which is the flexible form of context sensitivity that we will develop with our interventions later. For now, we just want to assess how flexible is the awareness of the client. The way we can do that is by asking questions about the context of the client's behavior and assess the richness and the relevance of his observation. Remember that language is our main tool in psychotherapy. And so it's mostly through language that we will be able to explore the client's context sensitivity. The different types of relational framings we saw in our last video can be used here in order to evoke the client's observation and description of the context. Spatial framing can be used to situate the location of experiences. Temporal framing will be helpful to explore what happens before, during, and after her behavior. Conditional framing will help identify the impact of what happens before and after, that is, the antecedents and consequences. For example, the therapist might ask, when do you feel anxious? What happens as a result of avoiding social interactions? Or, in what places do you feel anxious about contamination? Comparison and distinction framing can help assess if the client is sensitive to variations in the context. For example, the therapist might ask, what do you feel when you are not alone? 
Or in what situation do you feel most anxious? Now let's look in more detail at what it means to assess sensitivity to antecedents and consequences. As we saw before, antecedents are the parts of the context that happen before a behavior and can influence the likelihood that it will occur. For example, for some people, an interpersonal conflict can be an antecedent for the behavior of withdrawing. A feeling of anxiety or depression can be an antecedent for suicidal thoughts and actual attempts to kill oneself. Remember that with language, elements of the context can acquire all kinds of symbolic functions. So even things that are seemingly not relevant may actually have an important influence on the client's behavior. For example, for most people, being offered help, help probably doesn't trigger fear. But if they interpret this offer as an attempt to manipulate them because they have a history of abuse, for example, this can, be, this can very well trigger fear. So as we assess the client's sensitivity to antecedents, we need to pay attention to the variety of functions that events can have, both symbolic and intrinsic. Now, remember that sensitivity is not just noticing, but responding. So what we want to assess is not only if the client is able to notice antecedents, but how he responds to these antecedents. Some antecedents can have excessive influence and others not enough influence on the client's behavior. For example, a client might feel both excited to go to, for, to, go to a job interview because she's hoping she will get the job and scared because she's afraid of evaluation. If the fear has more influence than the excitement, the client is more likely not to go to that job interview. In that case, we could say that fear has excessive influence and excitement insufficient influence. Or said another way, the client is more sensitive to her fear than to her excitement. Consequences are elements of the context that happen after a behavior and increase or decrease its probability. If the consequence is desirable, the behavior tends to happen more often, and if the consequence is undesirable, the behavior tends to happen less often. Just as for antecedents, we need to take into account the various symbolic functions that events can have. For example, increased intimacy resulting from self-disclosure can be desirable and thus reinforcing for some people, but undesirable and punishing for others. The function of this consequence this depends on the client's symbolic and non-symbolic history with intimacy. And as for antecedents, we need to assess the degree of influence of these consequences. Some have more influence than others. Some have excessive influence and some not enough. For example, imagine a person suffering from chronic pain who starts exercising again as part of her physiotherapy. She might experience some pain, but also satisfaction to be able to move again. If the pain exerts more influence than the satisfaction, then this person might not exercise again. That would be a sign of excessive influence from pain and insufficient from satisfaction about moving again. We also need to take into account short-term and long-term consequences, and consequences in a variety of domains. For example, engaging in social interactions might lead to feeling anxious in the short term, but to a greater feeling of belonging. Drug use might make some, someone feel well at party, but horrible when going to work. All of these elements are potentially useful to explore, and as we encourage the clients to observe and describe these elements of the context, and the way he responds to them, we begin to identify the degree of flexibility of his context sensitivity. The last point we need to talk about in this tutorial is how to monitor improvement in context sensitivity. Assessment is not something we do just once at the beginning of therapy. And it's not something we do just once at each session either. It's something we do at each moment. At each moment, different elements are present in the client's context and his sensitivity to these elements can be assessed. For example, a therapist might ask, how did that make you feel to tell me that? Does that make you want to tell me more or less? Such question helps assess the client's sensitivity to an emotional consequence. That is, if he notices it and how he responds to it. So, improvement can be measured moment by moment and over time. Generally, an improvement in context sensitivity is reflected by new observations and new responses to contextual variables.
the client is more aware of the relevant elements of the context and responds to these elements in a way that is more useful to pursue his meaningful goals. New responses can look different ways, of course, and what is effective depends on each client's specific situation. Sometimes, just a change is already a good sign. It means that flexibility is increased, even if the new behavior is not effective. Here is a summary of the main points you've learned in this tutorial and that I encourage you to remember. In therapy based on RFT and CBS, the goal of assessment is to evaluate clients' flexible context sensitivity and functional coherence. Assessment is done in an experiential context by putting the client's experience at the center of our attention and by connecting the therapeutic process to the client's life. Assessing context sensitivity consists of measuring the client's awareness of the different elements of the context and his responses to these elements. Elements of the context include antecedents and consequences and their various symbolic and non-symbolic functions. Improvement in context sensitivity is assessed moment by moment and over time and is reflected by new observations and new responses to contextual variables. This is the end of this tutorial on psychological assessment. This tutorial was adapted from the first part of chapter 4 in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. If you want to watch the next tutorial on psychological assessment focused on assessing coherence, you can go to languageasintervention.com. You will also find other resources on the applications of RFT for clinical practice.